Well, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, the latest episode in our Keys webinar series, our monthly broadcast uh, to our clients around the world. We're delighted to have you with us. We've got uh, clients from 82 countries uh, today, and it felt like a good moment to think about a topic that's uh, in our research presentations, it's in the marketing press, and it's out there in the media at large. We thought it's a good moment to talk about generations. And I'm delighted to have our panel of experts with us today who are gonna share with us uh, their latest analysis on this very topic. I'm talking to you from London today, and I'm gonna be reflecting on some of the myths and realities we've been observing, looking at these uh, topics uh, in recent times. Then we're gonna go um, to Bangalore, where Geeta is going to share with us um, her perspectives on how we need to go beyond the stereotypes. Naomi, who's in Toronto, where it's very early, thank you Naomi, is going to show us what happens when you take a back seat and let the data tell the story. And it's still very early in Nashville, where we have Chris Murphy, uh, who is returning to the key stage with some questions for brands, and it's a fairly provocative set of questions he's going to be sharing with us too. Time for questions as we go as we go as we go through and do pop them into the chat box. We're, we're leaving some good space at the end uh, to uh, reflect on any of the topics that you wanted to raise with our participants. So thanks to the wonders of uh, our mobile phones, uh, we will uh, be able to share your questions with the panelists. So just to kick off, um, why might we want to look at these topics and really perhaps test ourselves uh, about what the real patterns on the ground seem to be. Well, our starting point is quite bold. We're finding that lots is written about generations, but a lot of that is misleading or wrong. Let's just take a look at some of the uh, things we can read in the uh, UK and US uh, press. We can see that Generation Z or Z, depending on where you're sitting, are work shy and can't be bothered to read their emails. They're canceling Christmas uh, by, by making life worse uh, for everybody and, uh, and having, uh, let's say, a different perspective on uh, festive celebrations. And indeed, uh, they are the silent majority which we need to engage. Uh, and it doesn't take a moment to do a little bit of back of the envelope maths to take that silent majority point to just think, really? Because they're actually 24% of the population around the world and rather fewer in many countries. Maybe we should go further and actually stop talking about generations altogether. That was the view in a very influential and quite famous letter uh, sent, an open letter sent to the Pew uh, Institute by a group of researchers and academics. We think that's going a little far. We feel that talking about generations can really help us better understand change, what's happening and why it's happening. But we do feel we need to have some discipline in what we're doing. If we're observing a change or a difference, particularly when it comes to different generations, we need to be alive to what type of effect it might be. Is it a life cycle effect? People tend to be more active or date more when they're young. It changes as they get older. Is it a period effect which impacts us all, however old we are? The COVID pandemic being a case in point there, we all have our story to tell. Or could it be a cohort effect where we have a particular generation who are different and they are staying different over time? So those are three building blocks which we find really useful in thinking about these topics alongside having a bit of discipline when we're doing our analysis. Now the generations these days, at least um, in some uh, contexts, are quite well defined, but, and there is a but, we do need to think about the context uh, of what we're doing when we're doing this kind of research. As Gita will show us in a moment, when and where you're born really matters. At different times uh, or in different places will shape your experiences and will shape your life. Similarly, we need to be careful about the language we use. When we're saying something about like Generation X, we may not mean to, but there's a kind of value judgment that we're putting out there by using that label. So we need to think about the labels, uh, I think, that, that we're using. Uh, 
and we also might need to think about the classifications we're using. It might be that I don't want to look in my survey at the 44 to 57s uh, who are Generation X. I might want to look at 40 to 59s and be relaxed about the labels. Thinking about surveys and data, one of the challenges we do have in relation to this topic is that we don't always have all of the information that we might like to in order to make definitive assessments or conclusions. We'd love to have longitudinal data over time that tracks people through their lives. There are some of that available, but it's not everywhere. We like tracking data, and there's quite a lot of that available now, uh, which helps us uh, understand change over time by age group, and Gita will do a little bit of a look at that in a moment. But it doesn't always go back so far, and also what we were asking 10 or 20 years ago may be less important today, and vice versa. So we don't always have the information at our disposal. One area where we do have some information, however, is on the bigger picture, the bigger context in which we're thinking about generations. And that's the realities of population change. And it's something we also need to have in our mindset. The headlines over the last year are the world population topping 8 billion. But the other headline, the reality, is that after 2050, we're going to see the world population starting to fall. It's a different scenario perhaps to what we learned at school where we learned all about burgeoning populations. 36 countries are already seeing their populations decline and if you're providing public services we're starting to see what that can mean. Schools closing for example in South Korea or in Japan. Italy one and a half million fewer school students than they had 10 years ago. What does it mean for our universities? What does it mean for who we train and how we train them? This example, of course, being from healthcare. And what does it mean for provision of public services? An example from the US looking at the questions around rural hospitals and whether they can be sustained in the way they are at the moment. So we have to think a little bit about where we're heading in terms of the world population as we look at different groups and different generations. Uh, as we mentioned, population decline is already a reality in many parts of the world, but what we're all starting to come to terms with and think about is what could this mean? It could be good, good fewer pressures on the environment, um, less, um, less unemployment and, and higher wages, a boost to investment and productivity. But there are real questions perhaps around public services and, and whether they can continue to be provided in the same ways as they are at the moment. What does it mean if we have fewer doctors, fewer innovators and fewer consumers to sell our products and services to? And today's challenge is, of course, what does this mean and what will this mean even more for the younger people in our countries? So more of this in our report. I, I'll leave you with a link uh, here. Uh, and what we've tried to do there is to look around the world, but also at the individual context of different countries uh, looking at this topic as seen uh, and as experienced in different places, because context really matters. And that's a topic which Gita is going to help us really think about the importance of time, the importance of place. And Gita, we're so pleased to have you with us to share your latest analysis uh, with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And like Simon said, uh, where and when really does matter. So one of the most reasonable arguments that is made against generational effects is how can context not matter? If you look at uh, the times that Gen X uh, sort of lived in and uh, which actually form their mindsets, there is so much of variation in that. In Germany, they were going through a process of unification, something that can impact even your sense of identity. US was at the peak of Reaganomics and the kind of counter arguments it set forth. Argentina dazzled by like a ta talent that you only get to see once in a millennia. Uh, South Africa on its journey to healing the wounds of apartheid, or if you were like me growing up in India, um, 
assassinations and communal rights, how could you not be scarred by that? How can all these contexts lead to the same mindsets? Even if you skip a few uh, decades forward, a decade and a half forward, and look at kind of events which shaped the minds of the millennials, you'll see that by now, Germany, a large economy, was already running its course. India had become the tech backend for the world, and uh, pivotal events had brought terrorism home to Americans. So the question really is, how can all of these different contexts create some kind of a unified generational perspective. And to an extent, the answer lies in some of these strong global currents of change which have been happening decade on decade. Affluence has been growing since the industrial time. The advancement in science has truly transformed our lives and newer and newer generations come to live and uh, their mindsets are formed in quite differing times. And in the recent times, the unprecedented information access has made a dramatic change. So these are the kind of events that can make a case for generational effects. But even before we get into that, there is an important question that we need to answer. And that is uh, of life stages. Uh, why should indeed a gen z person in their 20s think like the boomers or the senior generation who are past their 70s why should this even be a, a question is this a sign of generational difference or is it simply a difference in life stage and that's also a fairly reasonable question to make and at ipsos we have access to a lot of data some of it is longitudinal so we decided to put some uh, data to effect and examine these questions and in order to isolate the life stage effect uh, from the generational effect, we did two things. We looked at pure cohorts within each generation, the people who were born in the middle five years. We wanted to avoid the cusps who could perhaps have characteristics of more than one generation in them. The second thing that we did was we compared them when they were at the same life stage, at the same age. So comparing the Gen Z now with millennials about a decade ago in a similar way comparing millennials now to Gen X about a decade or so ago when they were both at roughly the same age. And what did we find? Um, just as I sort of spoke earlier, there are these uh, global currents of change. And because of that, we do see some generational effects uh, in, in themes which connect strongly with them. Right. So uh, here's a question that we ask survey after survey. What do you think of the state of affairs in your country? To what extent are you satisfied? Uh, this would seem like a generational effect with Gen Z more positive than millennials who are more positive than Gen X. But we really need to apply the test of whether this is life stage or is it truly generational? And when we do that, we do see that Gen Z now uh, compared to millennials when they were at a similar age, actually our Gen Z is far more positive. And the same pattern is seen when you compare millennials now with Gen Xers when they were at the age that millennials are now. So it would seem that in some situations, particularly those which connect with some of these broader global themes, that there is a generational effect. Uh, so we try to push the envelope forward and look for more complex issues. What if we look at issues where the context matters? Uh, let's look at issues, for instance, the rights of the trans people, trans men and women uh, should be allowed to live the way they want. The percentage agreement, you look at countries as diverse as UK, US, Italy and India, the Gen Z, the teal bars, are much higher in agreement with the statement than the orange bars who represent boomers. And this is something that one would sort of expect, and it kind of aligns with our stereotypes about this, uh, these generations. You're going to find a little uh, later in this webinar, Naomi will present some very interesting but startling uh, data 
uh, which may or may not align with some stereotypes that we hold. So here we see that generational effect does sort of line up with the kind of expectations that we have, and there is an impact. But what if we looked at issues which had some social and cultural kind of context, some traditional questions such as role of women in the society and the statement talks about a limited role uh, for women in society just to be good mothers and wives and here if we look at the percentage disagreement now you'll see that everywhere the teal bars are higher than the orange bars uh, so gen z is in stronger disagreement with this kind of a statement and has a lot more open-minded uh, perception more liberal perception about role of genders in india as well this is true but the interesting thing is that here we see the effect of context so in india you'll see that the gen x gen z the teal bar uh, though it's higher than the boomers in india is far more conservative as a manner of speaking than the boomers in the west the boomers in uk us and italy now this sort of brings to fore the fact that it's the context and some of these larger sweeping changes that define generations which are kind of in a tussle and one could conjecture that as we move forward and some of these global currents of change are to strengthen it is likely that we may be able to see uh, perhaps gen z is the first true global generation with that, I want to hand you back to Simon uh, to hear what he thinks of this conjecture. Well, yes, thank you, Geeta, and I think um, and thank you for that that that, that tour, that, that that tour of time, that tour of place, and that's so powerful uh, when you're starting to bring those themes um, themes together. And um, I mean, I guess one question, I, I suppose, look at looking at that, you you you've, you've Put all of this stuff into the mixer in terms of the the, the surveys going back over to, over time, and you, you've you've really been uh, uh, interrogating that. Um, for for those of us on the call, I, what were you did did you end up seeing more convergence or more polarization if if you were putting it all together? What what was your sense coming out of the preparation of this talk? I mean, that's a great question because I mean, when you hear about changes uh, for example that information brings it can bring polarization so which way will it head i believe it would be towards convergence because what we are talking about is formation of mindsets so when across different contexts people are receiving similar information and uh, they are in their formative years it is likely that we see in a manner of speaking, Gen Z people growing up in Ghana or in uh, Moldova or wherever, they tend mm. to acquire similar ways of thinking, similar ways of the world, views of the world, so to say. Yes, yes, and I think the um, I think the um, that that slide you had about the attitudes to um, the role of women thing was, was was really fascinating. The way the importance of context looking across, but it looks like we might have a cohort effect to to think about on those attitude points. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. We're going to come back to, to you uh, later because we're going to uh, be taking questions. So as I mentioned, do put any questions for the speakers uh, in the chat box. Um, but we're, we're now going to um, fly to early morning uh, Toronto. So uh, Naomi, thank you for being with us uh, at this hour. And thank you for sharing with us your perspectives, because I know you've been very much, um, if not sitting back in your chair, you've been sitting in your chair and seeing what happens when you let the data tell us the story. So over to you, Naomi. We're looking forward to your thoughts. Thanks, Simon. Um, so as Simon mentioned, I'm going to be sharing some data today, some of it very surprising about what we're seeing across generations. Um, and while, you know, it's very important to keep in consideration what Gita said about differences across cultures and across regions and the life stage effects, we do see that generational constructs can be useful, particularly trying to understand some of the trends that we see in the data. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, you know, let's look at the, the statement, I feel like things in my country are out of control. The two groups in the US that are most likely to believe that are more liberal left-leaning Gen Zs, the blue bar on the left, and your more conservative boomers, the red bars 
on your right, a whopping 90% for both, albeit for different reasons. But it really helps us understand, you know, the reason for such a large political divide in the United States. It's not just a, an issue of left versus right, it's also an issue of young versus old. Another example, um, let's look at the statement, buying, thing gives, buying things gives me a lot of pleasure. Um, and we see that millennials are higher on this, um, as well as Gen Zs, and that's globally true everywhere. Um, gen millennials tend to be um, more uh, consumerist, consumerist in their ideals. Um, but if we think about countries like India and China, that proportion, that 59%, jumps to three quarters. And then if we combine that with the size of those demographics in those countries, we really start to characterize the consumerism and the rise of the middle class that we're seeing in Asia. Um, another example, if we look at housing affordability as an, uh, as an example, um, we see that globally Gen Z is twice as likely to rate housing affordability as a key issue for them compared to boomers. Um, now, if you combine that with the fact that you have 70% of Gen Zs that feel they'll never be able to own a home and 60% of Gen Zs that feel like they're going to be a financial burden on their families, potentially because they're staying at home longer or living with relatives, you know, we see we have a real crisis on our hands when it comes to younger people. Um, so these are just a few examples to highlight, you know, that it is useful to, to look at some of this data. Uh, for the next seven or eight minutes, I'm going to share a few vignettes with you about generations and the goal is not to you know share some universal truth that explains everything we need to know about one generation or another but it's really to help us understand you know what are the differences in terms of how these groups feel what are their, their their emotions and their attitudes how they behave and what are the resources that they have available to them which impacts how they behave as consumers um, so let's start with the very provocative question that Gita had posed is Gen Z the first truly global generation? Um, so we looked into this a bit and we can't come up with a definitive answer, but it turns out that in some respects they are the first truly global generation, but maybe not in the way that you might've thought. They are globally the most stressed generation and that's universally true. Um, here we're looking at data for people who have told us that they're feeling stressed right now. And if we look at boomers, you can see there's quite a bit of variability across countries, uh, up in some countries, down in others. And if I were to plot Gen, um, Gen X or if I was going to plot millennials, they would look relatively uh, the same in terms of having a lot of variability. But if we look at Gen Z, um, we can see that universally across countries, they tend to be the most stressed and universally uh, stressed. Um, if we look at other metrics like demand for health care, uh, mental health services, um, we, we see that they also tend to be universally higher. Um, so they're the most stressed generation. Um, they're also the most lonely and bored generation. Um, so here's another uh, sort of fun chart to look at. We've plotted a bunch of different negative emotions that we ask different groups about. So are you bored, defeated, frustrated, indifferent, lonely, scared? And we can plot how different generations map to these different emotions at any given time. This is the latest data from August. And if we look at boomers, we can see that's what their, uh, their chart looks like. They tend to be a little bit more frustrated, but with all of the crises that are impacting the world, everyone's a little bit more frustrated these days. Um, we look at Gen X, they, they follow a similar pattern, a little bit more negative, and millennials are roughly the same. But when we look at Gen Z, what we see is they are significantly more bored and significantly more lonely than other generations. Um, and there, there may be a few different reasons for that. We can hypothesize, right? They may be uh, coming out of the pandemic, have made fewer uh, relationships, fewer friends. Um, it, it, so there is that, that context that, that Guido was talking about that will characterize this generation going forward. Um, but we're also seeing that the, they're, they're coupling at lower rates than other, uh, than other generations. You know, we talk about that population decline. Um, and so it's no surprise that in countries like Japan, we have national matchmaking um, programs. In Italy, uh, a recently uh, launched Ministry of Family and Fertility. Um, so you know, it really impacts uh, government decisions as well as, uh, as well as brands and companies. Um, now, if we think of why, uh, Gen Z might be the loneliest generation, uh, which again, it turned out to be true across countries. 
Um, we can also look at how they make friends. So let's pose another question. Um, do younger generations make friends differently in this post-pandemic world? And it turns out they do. Um, so if we look uh, at a few statements across generations, this one is, I spend more time in interacting with my friends online than in person. We can see that's almost half of Gen Z and millennials that feel that way, and two times as many millennials as boomers. Similarly, I'm more likely to form relationships online than in person, uh, four out of 10 millennials uh, and Gen Z. And again, that's three times as many boomers. And so if, if I'm a brand for whom occasions is really important, uh, if I'm in entertainment or alcohol, uh, and, it's, uh, and these social interactions help drive the value of my brand, um, then I've got a real issue here that we need to investigate. Now, the good news is, if we look about, if we look at these millennials and we look at these Gen Zs, you know, we said they're they're more lonely. They do tend to look for help. Um, so I'd like to make new friends and expand my social circle. They also tend to be the highest. They don't want to be a lonely, and they may not necessarily want to just meet people online. That's just the reality of their situation. Um, and they find it more difficult to connect with people now than before the pandemic. So again, that may characterize them going forward, but it also creates an opportunity for brands, for marketers to try to create those occasions in which they can connect and meet other people. Um, so, it, you know, it's super important um, in terms of how they, how they make friends. Now we promised some myth busting, I believe in the description for the webinar. So let's also look at some, some myths around generations that we see. Um, and one of them is really around environmentalism, around sustainability and who your most uh, important customers may be when it comes to sustainable offers. Um, what we're finding is that environmental activism is not synonymous with you. Uh, so what you're seeing on the slide here is Ipsos has developed a global segmentation um, for sustainability. And we have five different segments all the way from on the left your least active uh, environmentally, your disengaged denialists, to the right where you have activists who are your most um, active, as the names might suggest, uh, group. Now, it, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of these, we don't have time today, but if you look at the, the names of them, disengaged denialists, busy bystanders, conflicted contributors um, who are conflicted financially, and pragmatists who tend to do the easy things. And if we try to hypothesize where might the different generations um, sit within these segments? Conventional wisdom tells us that, well, you know, certainly there's a lot of Gen Zs and there's a lot of millennials in the activists group because we tend to think of them as caring about the environment and we tend to think of activists that we see, uh, you know, out of protesting to be young people. Um, well, it turns out that's not as true as we might think. Um, only 18% of Gen Z and a similar proportion of millennials are activists, um, whereas nearly a quarter of boomers tend to fall into that activist group. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, those disengaged denialists, those are the ones that for whom the environment isn't important um, or they tend to deprioritize it because they feel it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter anymore um, because we've gone too far, um, regardless of whether they, they're not taking action because they're not interested. Um, or because they feel like it doesn't matter anymore, they still fall into that group. And if we look at that group, it's 27% of Gen Zs, um, and, and it's one of the highest uh, groups for them to fall into, um, and only 13% of boomers. So not what we might think about the, the group that tends to be the least involved in sustainable initiatives. Uh, so that's one myth. Another myth we can look at is around digital behavior. You know, we tend to look at omnichannel shopping and we tend to look at our digital offers as being more targeted towards Gen Zs, towards millennials. Um, and, and that certainly is true. Uh, but if we think about the, the broader population, it's not just true for those two groups. Um, if we look at uh, statements like, I tend to research products online, even if I tend to buy in store, um, sure, seven out of 10 millennials, but also um, nearly six out of 10 boomers. Right? So it's all age groups, particularly after the pandemic with this digital acceleration, we see that all, all groups 
are now omni-channel shoppers. Similarly, I find it important to be able to buy something online and have it delivered. Um, you know, three quarters of millennials, um, Gen X, but also again, uh, six and ten boomers. So, you know, important not to ignore those groups as we think about our e-commerce initiatives. Um, and then finally to Gen X, which often doesn't get talked about, um, but if we think about which generation is most impacted uh, today with, with the uh, crisis related to inflation um, and rising prices, we often think it's the younger generations, right? They're, they have lower incomes, um, you know, they, they, they tend to be living at home and they're trying to get into the housing market, as we mentioned, and we tend to think of them as, as most struggling. Um, but what we find actually is that the, the, the current um, crisis is impacting Gen X the most. I'm living paycheck to paycheck um, is, is now a quarter uh, of Gen X. And if we look at other metrics like um, uh, prioritizing personal finances uh, for personal finances as a top priority, we see it's a similar proportion of Gen X. And the reason being um, is not only that, uh, you know, they tend to have houses where uh, which as, as interest rates rise, um, their payments rise, they also tend to be supporting families, but they also, so there's some life stage effects there, um, but they are also uh, one of the first generations that's dealing with parents that are continuing to age and um, that they're having to, to take care of. And also uh, there's a delayed uh, sort of transfer of generational wealth as their parents age, um, they haven't passed that wealth down to them. So they're sort of pinched in the middle and struggling on both ends. Um, so those are the vignettes I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, hopefully you find them interesting. Really, you know, in, in summary for me is that I feel it's super interesting and super important to look at generations because it helps us understand people's emotions and attitudes better. It helps us understand behaviors and it helps us understand the resources that different groups have access to, which impacts them as consumers. Um, so with that, uh, I'll send it back to Simon. Uh, thank you very much. Simon, over to you. Well, th thank you, um, Naomi, for that panorama uh, of, of what we're seeing when we look at the, the, the landscape of, of data. And um, one very quick question, um, your segmentation, which reminds us of the uh, perhaps Generation Z aren't as activist as you might think. That certainly stirred some interest on the call. That, that, that uh, analysis is available internationally. That's right, isn't it? The, the, we can look at it by country, for example. Correct. Yeah, we have we have that data for um, I think more than 15 countries now. We're we're, we're using it globally, uh, and okay. it's a really interesting scheme. There's, you know, I'd love to talk about all five of those generations. Um, unfortunately, not not today's yeah, call, exactly. but uh, perhaps next time. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, Naomi is going to give you a few bonus slides in the pack that we share uh, afterwards. Um, just very quickly before we go to, to Chris, um, you know, we, we were asking you to be a researcher here. Um, and so with your researcher and person hat on, what surprised you most from 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 doing that tour of the data? Yeah, no, honestly, Simon, it's, you know, that slide about occasions, about how people form relationships. Um, and, and I just, you know, I see that in my own kids. I look at my 14 year old um, and, and how he is interacting with his friends. You know, like I used to just knock on my friend's doors and, and you know, I said that to him, well, just, you know, just go down the street and knock on their door. And he, and he finds the idea absolutely horrifying, right? And just that shift in mindset from one generation to the next, to me, it just, you know, if I'm thinking about the future of how he's gonna grow into a consumer, into a citizen, it's gonna impact all sorts of aspects of his life. And it's, you know, it, it just, again, just in one generation, that that, that shift I think is is incredible. Uh, that's all right, yes. Thought provoking them on for all of us. No, thank you, thank you for that, uh, Naomi. And well, one person whose door we don't have to knock on is Chris, because he's here with us now, smiling, uh, smiling away. And uh, he's gonna help us take the story forward. And uh, Chris, you've been looking at this from a different edge of, uh, of the age spectrum, haven't you? So over to you. Tell, tell us tell us your findings. All right. Thanks so much, Simon. And uh, hello, everyone. And Nami, I think we've had some shared parenting moments from the story that you just told. Um, so the, the title of this sequence is, Oh, Boomers, Where Art Thou? Um, and the, the, the very short answer to that question is not everywhere, at least not all at once. Uh, so if, if we have a look at uh, uh, the, the baby boom, right, um, if we define that as those born from 1946 to 1964, 
um, you know, and take a look at the percentage of population of those age 58 to 76 in several countries here. You quickly see that the word boomer might not exactly be a globally applicable term uh, for those in Brazil, India, Nigeria, and many other non-Western countries. Few would actually point to the 1946 to 64 era as their baby boom. Um, and uh, the, the median age in, in a lot of these stories uh, or countries tells the, the same story. Um, and then if I take a quick glance at some birth numbers from the US, and India, and Nigeria, um, you know, we can quickly surmise that different parts of the world have actually experienced their booms in different points in time. So again, maybe this term boomer is a little bit globally suspect and maybe we should start uh, using slightly different language. I offer up a few alternatives here. Mature adults, older adults, or even adults of a certain age. Um, but uh, uh, whatever we call them, um, I think we do need to have a bit of a vocabulary adjustment. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to call them mature adults, not meaning to imply other generations aren't mature. Um, but uh, with that adjustment, uh, let's have a look at these folks who on the whole are doing pretty well. Um, in fact, I'm gonna uh, call this a story of contentment, asset accumulation, and a bit of marketing neglect. Um, so uh, if we take a broad look globally, uh, just at how people are feeling physically, mentally, you actually see that mature adults are doing just as well as people who are a fraction of their age. Um, and then if we look financially, if, if we shine our spotlight on the U.S. for just a moment, we can see that just over a quarter of the population, most of whom are mature adults and their elders, are controlling 70% of the assets in, in the country. So fair to say, there's quite a lot of buying power there. And if I expand that lens globally, we find that 77% of mature adults are actually feeling financially stable. And that's even in the midst of an international poly crisis. So uh, I wanna throw a few, uh, what I think will be very memorable numbers at you. So let's go back to the US for a moment, where we've got this uh, percentage of people, right? Mature adults and their elders that are 27%, controlling 70% of the assets, and globally, um, the, the numbers might not be quite that dramatic, but, uh, but there are still proportionally or directionally the same. Um, and compare that to the percent of time uh, that, that uh, marketing communications features these people in a primary role in the casting. And this is a number from our uh, creative assessment database here at Ipsos. The figure is 8%, 27% of people, 70% of assets only turning up 8% of the time in, in casting. Um, and you know what? They've noticed. Uh, so um, you know, uh, when we look at this, uh, this score around my generation is well represented in the ads I see, you can see that only 34% of mature adults would agree with that. Um, and on a semi-related note, 80% of mature adults would agree that it's important to age gracefully without resorting to expensive cosmetics or procedures. Now, why would I mention that here? Well, I want to have a, a kind of a fun look at uh, casting habits for, from some popular entertainment. So just from the pictures that I'm flashing here, what do you notice? A lot of these folks have something in common despite their real age. It's their original hair color. Um, and even in the latest Indiana Jones film, yes, Harrison Ford, he does play it gray, but isn't it interesting that in the marketing, that hair, those wrinkles, they're shrouded in mysterious shadow. Uh, so despite controlling a very healthy percentage of assets, this group is curiously neglected in marketing. And when they are represented, it's often with the implication that they should want to look and act younger. Now that might seem a little crazy on the surface. You know, these ratios of buying power to casting rates, it just seems a little insane, right? But, but maybe there is uh, at least some explanation for this uh, because it can be harder to unlock spending when people are in a behavioral groove and when they're happy with what they've got. Um, so uh, despite those healthy bank balances that I was quoting a moment ago, mature adults are more likely to focus purchases on simple necessities. In fact, compared to millennials, 
30, uh, they're 30% more likely to say, I just buy the stuff I need. And they're 20% more likely to say, try to keep stuff simple as far as possessions are concerned. Further, as Nami shared earlier, more millennials do express pleasure in buying things. And uh, they also aspire to have expensive possessions, at least more so than the mature adults. 46% uh, of millennials would agree with the statement. I admire people who own expensive homes, cars, clothes. Only 14% of, of mature adults would, would say the same, which is kind of fun as, as an American. Um, th this generation in the US was once painted as a hedonistic, me-focused generation. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that most mature adults are now expressing very little interest in aspirational brand badging these days. Taking this point a little bit further, when, when millennials are saving uh, their money, they're doing it with a purpose. Um, uh, a home purchase, saving for the future, uh, for a, you know so, something big, right? Uh, but when mature adults do it, it's often for no real plan at all. It's just a habit. They're just accumulating. Um, and with the exception of home improvement, where mature adults are quite active, um, we do see this sort of dynamic playing out in actual purchase behavior in numerous sectors, where if you compare mature adults to millennials, the millennials do indeed purchase more alcohol, uh, personal care, clothing, um, and home electronics. Uh, and and uh, this graph was very deliberately chosen uh, because it helps us understand things a little bit more. Uh, when we compare to mature adults, millennials are also more likely to engage in going to restaurants, uh, socializing outside the home, going to bars, going to movies, going to sporting events, going to the gym, the common verb there being go as opposed to stay, right? Uh, so, so when it comes to going out, um, millennials uh, uh, and, and the, all the younger generation, for that matter, much more likely to do so. So with younger consumers more engaged in a number of categories and out of home activities, perhaps we can be forgiven a little bit for peddling to some of those natural interests as, as a marketing community. Um, but all of this brings us to some really globally relevant questions. Um, if we want to unlock the spending power that I was talking about a moment ago, uh, it really becomes vital to understand that relationship between accumulation, maybe even the word hoarding, <laughs> contentment, and participation. Um, and if you start to combine some of these sector tendencies that I was just talking about with the aging trends that Nami spoke of, with the wealth transfers, that uh, transfer realities that Nami spoke of, what does this mean? for the future of consumption? Some pretty big questions that, that uh, we need to answer uh, both in terms of governments and commercial uh, entities. Um, but, but either way, it is time to engage this group and to do so on their terms. Remember, not all, but the vast majority of this age group is telling us they want to age gracefully. They don't see themselves cast in the messages they receive. Uh, so maybe we don't fixate so much on selling them what we have or trying to convince them to be something they're not, but try, try to find out what they want and then make that. So the point is, um, if we want to get past this thing of accumulation, that's only going to give way to economic participation through relevant empathetic stimulation. We have to engage. Uh, so if, I'll leave you with a few challenges for brand leaders and, and the insights community. Uh, one, I, I would challenge us to adjust our international language, at least. Um, and picking up on some themes from before, you know, when we do speak of generations, are we doing so in overly serious, typical, broad brushstrokes? Um, and then globally, should we be really referring to mature adults as boomers when that term really is locally irrelevant in a lot of places? Brand leaders, two huge questions. How much do you really know about the different types of mature adults? Again, not one size does not fit all by any means. Uh, and then secondly, what does it take to engage them and start tap into that buying power? And then from a research standpoint for the insights players on this call, are we making generational comparisons in a disciplined way? Um, Gita put on a how-to clinic in, in, in terms of how to do that in a really disciplined way before. I love that. Um, and then ask yourself this, at what age do we cap survey participation? So I think we, we might need a little bit of a vocabulary adjustment when it comes to boomers, but whatever we call them, 
um, they are a segment with great power that can't find itself in modern communications casting. And a lot of them might not be quite so obsessed with clinging to a demographic to which they no longer belong. Uh, so they can be difficult to engage perhaps, but we're likely to succeed in doing so if we do that on their terms. With that, back to you, Sai. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, for really uh, challenging us in terms of some of the ways we're looking at this topic. And I, it's perhaps rare on sessions like this that we get into questions around grammar. But uh, you know, we started off thinking about the definitions and what, what we mean by those definitions. And I was quite struck by your reminder, you were talking about different verbs, go versus stay. And actually yeah. it was quite a useful re reference to help us think if we're trying to look at people's context in terms of how we spend the, the time. Um, so thank you so, so much for that. And we're gonna come, come on to some more questions from uh, our clients in a moment, but um, just, You've been sort of sitting and, and, and hearing uh, the other speakers as well. Are there any particular takeaways that you'd like to emphasize, Chris, just from uh, what we've been discussing uh, today as we think about brands and we think about the questions for the future? Yeah, I guess um, thinking about what, what Gita and Nami shared, uh, I mentioned it a moment ago, but, but this notion of really disciplined generational analysis, you know, controlling for life stage effects where we can, that really uh, struck, struck me as, as some great analytic wisdom there from, from, from Gita. Um, and just remembering that, um, you know, these generational differences, they, they exist across countries, but even within country, right? Uh, so, you know, not all boomers in the U.S. are anti-transgender. Um, you know, uh, th there are sub-segments, right, that, 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 that exist. Um, so we, we need to be conscious of that. Um, now, uh, I think the other thing that was established was that, yeah, um, generations do matter. Um, and you know, we may even be seeing evidence of a more globally aligned Gen Z. Um, I could go into theories as to why, why that is, but, but it's interesting to see that evidence. And I think mm -hmm. as, as a search community, we really need to plumb those depths yeah. more. So I, I was fascinated by, by that. And then in if I sum up mine, uh, my piece of, really quickly, I would say my challenge would be for all of us, I, I include myself here, we can't be lazy and just paint these generations with these broad, right, uh, stereotypical uh, brushes. We've got to be willing to learn and engage. Otherwise, we're going to strand uh, a, a lot of buying power out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you struck a chord with, we had a question from uh, one of the clients who, who clearly had been already trying to come up with some slightly different ways of looking at the, the, the mature adults or the older groups rather than as a big block. And um, uh, thinking about your point you just mentioned there, Chris, I'm going to come to, to Gita actually. You mentioned this point about to take the example of Generation Z, which are often talked about just as a, as a group uh, and how it may differ, including by country. I mean, Gita, what's your advice for us um, thinking about India, you know, the largest population in the world uh, now? Um, you know, do, do you, are you using the labels of um, Generation Z and, and boomers in uh, extensively in your research? And, and what refinements are, are, you waking, are, you, are you making, for example, if we're trying to get, um, let's say, beyond, uh, let's say, an overall general um, measure? So, Simon, as you probably know, there's a whole lot more heterogeneity within India as such, right? Even in some of the data that we've seen, it actually represents more the voice of the digital Indian, so to say. Mm -hmm. So if, even if we were just to contrast that, we would find differences. And yet I find that clients uh, in India are increasingly looking at Gen Z uh, as, as perhaps a meaningful cohort and uh, a cohort that can be meaningfully uh, targeted in a unified kind of a way. Uh, at the same time, I think I just want to underline what Chris said a little bit earlier. We, all that the data shares and shows us is we just can't be lazy about some of these things. Uh, yes, as we go forward, I do believe generations is a new dimension that we have uh, to slice and dice people and examine the differences between them but to lean heavily as uh, you know some tend to do and and just go with these kind of broad strokes of differences i think that would be erroneous 
So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are contexts where thinking about generations is very useful even in India, especially because in our demography, uh, there is still a huge base of youth and, and that's where the purchasing power and the future of consumption, etc., rests. So they are definitely an interesting cohort, but I don't think anyone would imagine they are like a homogenous lot. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love that, Gita. I, I would challenge it. Simon, here's a question for you. Can you complete this sentence? All boomers, blank. All boomers, blank. Is there well, a way to complete that sentence? Yeah, I, 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 I uh, you're getting, but you're, you're, you're making me struggle with my English now. I think we would probably be saying uh, all. All boomers share a common definition, but that definition came from the United States. Oh, uh, nice! <laughs> and that definition is perhaps based on people who grew up at a particular point in time. So uh, it can be useful, uh, but be careful how you use it. So that's a very long sentence, so I apologize, folks. But uh, uh, I think that's probably what we're saying, because we are thinking about context. Geeta, you reminded us about growing up in the 1980s and the 2000s. Uh, now we're growing up in, let's say, the, the, the 2010s. I'm going to come to Naomi now because lots of interest in, in, in what you were sharing on the data side of things. And, and I think you've got one of the questions is around the information context uh, that, that, that people have. And thinking about this theory of perhaps there are certainly some commonalities about this Generation Z group now. Is there anything else you'd want to share with us, Naomi, about the kind of the context in terms of uh, how perhaps Generation Z and Z are receiving and consuming information? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few things that we're starting to see, right? And, and one of them, I think, is, you know, there is the sense that in terms of access to information, um, there's some global consistency, right? Everyone has access to more information. I mean, put aside some countries where that may not be possible, but um, the, the, what we're finding is actually, if you look at the data, the type of information that people are consuming um, actually has more of an impact than the age of the person receiving the information. And so what I mean by that is if you look at, you know, I, I think I, in, in the opening slide we, we highlighted sort of left-leaning versus right-leaning or conservative versus um, liberal. If you look at the type of media that people consume, whether it is more conservative media or centrist media um, or um, liberal media, that actually has more impact on how a person behaves than necessarily their age, right? So there is that, there is that for sure that Gen Z is, has access to more information and millennials had access to more information than Gen X, um, but the type of information matters mm -hmm. and, and will actually impact behaviors and decisions uh, more so than, than just how old you are. Yeah, no, that's a such that's such a good reminder. Actually, again, coming back to actually, uh, Gita, I've got those slides about 80s and 2000s in in my head because, of course, that diversification of the information sources and in some places polarization of the informa information sources wasn't quite as variegated, let's say, uh, yeah. uh, certainly in some of the earlier generations. So I think that's really uh, important reminder of that. Yeah, the, um, not just context of what we're growing up, but what then may continue through through time. Um, Gaty, we just to pick up on your your point about um, different perspectives and and uh, and the context side of things. We had a um, a client on the call asking particularly about uh, Africa, and uh, we did have a case study in the report that we're sharing with you in, in South Africa, and it comes back to. Um, points I think all of the speakers have raised about being careful about the labels because that's one where actually one of the uh, our South African colleagues always remind us is actually we're often looking at the the born freeze the people who who came of age since the end of apartheid and that's the way we often try to uh, build a lens to, to then ask the detailed questions that we that we need to so thank you everybody we're, we're, we're up on um uh, we're up on the hour short, shortly, so we really appreciate you being with us uh, today. I must say a big thank you to all of our uh, speakers. Uh, as I say, we'll, all of this will be available to you. We'll be sending you the, the recording, the presentations, including a few bonus bonus slides for your delectation, uh, and indeed a link to the report that we've done. And so lovely to have you with us, and do join us in six weeks' time when we're going to be uh, thinking about whatever happened to the new normal. Uh, so watch out for that as we explore people's work, health, 
and life from uh, that angle. So thank you so much for being with us, everybody, and have a good rest of day. All the best.